Hi, thanks for coming. Let's jump right into it. So it will not surprise you to hear, uh, because we are here in a learning and cognition symposium, that learning is an important process for animals throughout their lives. They need to learn a number of different things, including how to collect food, how to attract mates, and importantly, at all life stages, how to avoid predators. Luckily for animals that live in social groups, they can use these groups to facilitate their learning in different ways. For instance, if fish are living in a school and one individual gets eaten, but the rest are able to escape, then potentially the next time this school of fish sees a predator coming, they'll know um, a little bit earlier to avoid the predator and get out of there. So social learning has been studied a fair amount um, in adult and juvenile animals, but much less so at the embryonic stage, especially in oviparous organisms, because it's just kind of hard to know what's going on inside an egg. So our study is aiming to start to fill that gap, and we chose to use fish because we know that a lot of species of fish are very social at the adult and juvenile stages, but again, we just don't really know if that sociality affects them at the embryonic stage. So we have a few specific questions, starting with um, the presence of conspecifics and if that will alter their anti-predator responses. We wanted to also start to pinpoint when learning can emerge in embryonic development, and then finally, we wanted to see if there was an interaction between those first two questions. So we wanted to know if um, the onset of learning would be altered by um, some physical social conditions. We used fathead minnows for this study. Um, they are small and they will breed year round, which makes them a pretty ideal model organism for us. And importantly, they also have an innate recognition of an alarm cue which is a pheromone that's produced in their skin and is released into the environment as an olfactory signal when the skin is broken, which would generally happen during a predation event. Um, so when that cue is released, we expect that since um, these embryos living inside eggs, they can't flee, but we would expect them to instead hold still and freeze as their predator response in order to avoid predation. Um, so they have an innate recognition of that alarm cue, but they do not have that same innate recognition of predators. So they have to learn through association that the predator also means danger is coming. We used bluegill sunfish as our predator. Um, they're a common predator of minnows, and we just kept them in a big tank and collected water directly from their tank for immediate use in our study. So we set up our minnows into breeding groups of two females to one male and we checked for eggs at least twice a day. When we found eggs, we placed them into a number of different conditions, including their group size of either two to five or 10 to 15, and their arrangement either clustered, meaning that the embryos were in contact with one another, or dispersed, meaning that they were not touching one another. They were also placed into either control water with no additional cues, or predator and alarm water, which you'll hear me refer to as PAC moving forward. The embryos were um, tested beginning on day three and running through day five. So from about halfway up until the end of embryonic development, they usually hatch around day five. And they were tested in either control water or predator water without the alarm cue. And that was to see if they had made the association between the predator and the alarm. So these are some embryos. Um, they're on day three and they're, on, they're in control water. So you'll see at the bottom this graph here with these vertical red bars um, that represents a burst of activity. So every time you see these guys roll or flip over, whatever, um, that produces this burst of activity. We used burst count as our um, response variable in our models. We used generalized linear mixed effects models to analyze this data. And as I mentioned, we used burst count as the response variable. We tested a variety of different fixed effects and interactions, which I'll go into more in just a second here. And we also included parental identity as a random effect in all of our models um, to account for any genetic correlations. So starting off with day three, um, we saw that our PAC embryos were more active than our control embryos overall, regardless of their test conditions. And we saw no response to those test conditions for either the control or the PAC embryos. So this indicates that day three might just be a little too early for these embryos to be learning. When we looked at our two social conditions, the arrangement and group size, we saw that both of them were significant, such that the 
dispersed embryos were more active than the clustered embryos, and the larger groups were more active than the smaller groups. And those trends continue across all three days of testing. So moving on to day four, uh, here we saw no real effect of the embryo treatment between the control and PAC, but we did see an effect of the test treatment for the PAC embryos only. So they were more active when they were in the control water as opposed to when they were tested in predator water. And this indicates that um, they are perhaps learning that the predator means danger, um, and they are responding by having that expected freezing response. And again, our arrangement and group size were significant the same way that they were on day three. And on day five, we saw that our control embryos were overall more active than our PAC embryos. And as we expected, same as day four, our PAC embryos were more active when they were tested in control water rather than when they were tested in predator water. However, we also saw a response with our control embryos where those tested in predator water were more active than those tested in control water. So this could be either um, just a random artifact of the data or it could be a response to a semi-novel stimulus. Um, that's, um, data analysis is ongoing at this point, so that is a question yet to be answered. And one more time, our arrangement and group size were significant such that the clustered embryos were less active than the dispersed and the smaller groups were less active than the larger groups. Finally, um, we wanted to take a look at whether there was an interaction between um, their social conditions and the onset of learning. So to do that, I did a couple of different three-way interactions of test day and arrangement and test day and group size. And what I saw was that neither of those interactions were significant. So um, this indicates that there is not necessarily a link between when they can start learning and um, their social conditions that we tested. So um, just to circle back and remind you of our original questions and the answers that we have for them at this point, um, we did see evidence that our social conditions altered um, their anti-predator responses such that the clustered embryos and the smaller groups have stronger responses than the dispersed groups or the larger groups. We saw evidence that learning could emerge as early as day four, but at this stage we have no evidence that the social conditions that we tested here affect when they can begin learning. This doesn't mean that they aren't using social learning, it just um, we just didn't see that that altered when the learning could occur. In the future, we plan to look into things like social facilitation and observational conditioning. We might want to pinpoint a little bit more robustly when exactly learning can occur, and we will look into other aspects of sociality and social um, mechanisms and strategies that they might be using for learning. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I would also like to thank my lab members who helped keep my fish alive. I'd like to thank Ball State for buying our fish. And my email address is here in case we don't have time for questions. Thanks.